All right, welcome back to Sports Line. John Burton with you, and we are talking about the great documentary that's getting ready to come out later this month, Jumpin' Johnny, the incredible uh, true story of Dr. John Klein, the former Harlem Globetrotter who uh, beat addiction and became quite an activist and quite a, a humanitarian. We're here with Aaron Doreen. I've known you forever, and I just screwed up your name. Aaron Deneen, creative director of Addiction Campuses, and Cameron McCaslin, the video producer and editor, uh, also from Addiction Campuses, who put together this great documentary. And now this documentary premieres when? Next Thursday at Next the Thursday. Theater. Okay. And January 24th. Mm -hmm. January 24th. January 24th. Very few tickets remain, but uh, there's still an opportunity for you to go and see it. Uh, I definitely recommend it. It's about the former Harlem, Harlem Globetrotter, um, J uh, Dr. John Klein. Uh, guys, uh, before we went to break, we were kind of talking about everything that Dr. Klein went through, right? A, a basketball star in Indiana, and then uh, played uh, a number of years with the Harlem Globetrotters, uh, played some pro ball here and there, but then kind of really got hooked uh, into the drug life. Yeah. Um, spent about 10 years, kind of disappeared, like right? nobody really knew where he was or what he was doing. What did he what did he say that life was like for him? Because uh, we were talking before we went on the air. He was kind of couch surfing for a while, right? He was kind of bouncing in and out of uh, different places. He was. It, it was a lot of going from place to place and just finding old friends who would set him up. Uh, his teammate, Ernie Wagner, who he knew, you know, as a childhood friend, they played together at Wayne, they played together as Globetrotters. Ernie had got into the drug game as doing sales. Basically, Ernie was always kind of looking out for him, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it's, it's – it can be hard to take care of a drug addict sometimes because you don't always know where they're going to be or what they're going to do. Right. Um, all right. So somehow he's able to get out of this. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the best story um, that he told when he when he decided? You know, again, a lot of addicts decide after a while, right? I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I want to. I want to yeah. come through this. What steps did he take, and what did he do post drugs? I think that's a, a really good way to put it is being sick and tired of being right. sick and tired. He <laughs> he had children and he wanted to do better for his children. I think that's kind of the paramount to the entire story. He wanted to do good to teach them how to do good. And at a certain point he went down to Kentucky. At the time it was one of the only drug centers in the in America. Hmm. Um, he tried to get clean. He didn't accomplish that there. He okay. relapsed, came back to Detroit, and it really got to a point where I think he just, he, when he hit his rock bottom, he was like, I can't do this anymore. He went to a place uh, there in Detroit and called Lafayette Clinic. He started just tapering off of the drugs, which is not a thing that we recommend. It's not It's not something that anyone should do by themselves. It's very difficult, Absolutely. right? I mean, physically, mentally, right? I mean, I mean we've all, we, we, we've seen a lot of the 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 heard a lot of the stories about people who try especially a drug like heroin yeah. you know that people try to kick cold turkey if you will i mean it's 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 one of the, it's some of the worst mental and physical times of your right. life but but he fought through it and and that's kind of one of the things we talk about in the documentary about how much times have changed but times have stayed the same heroin is still heroin even sure. 50 years later it still is hard to kick but now there's so many different ways that you can combat it um, we tell people all the time it's it's you no matter what you have to make that decision that you want to get better mm -hmm. and a lot of that is just making that first phone call uh, we say at addiction campus all the time reach out to us we can help put you in a way because when you're on drugs you're not always making the best decisions for yourself right. you right. have to have someone else that can guide you but first you have to decide you want to do that and i think that's where dr klein was he wanted to get better he didn't know how to get better right so he, he found a place in lafayette clinic there in detroit back in the day who kind of said, okay, we're going to help you do this, and this is how we want you to do it. And at a certain point, he was like, I can beat this. He kept at it. He kept going back. He kept going to the meetings after he got clean. And ultimately, he was able to not only get himself clean and sober, but inspire a lot of other people to do the same. Yeah, I mean, obviously, he decided at some point that, you know, once he got clean, he decided, I'm going to help others. Um, and it's pretty and he accomplished so many things talk about what what dr klein was able to do once he got clean to help others and to kind of really get his message out and 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 kind of reach out and and kind of pay it forward i guess so yeah. because a lot of people did a lot of things for him i'm sure to help him get clean and now he's paying it forward helping others which i think is remarkable well, I think one of the first things he did, he decided that education was important. It was important for him to get ahead. So whenever he got clean and sober, one of the things he did to stay on that path was he got himself back in college. And he owned a bachelor's, then a master's, and then a doctorate. Wow. And then dedicated time to charity and just to 
going and talking to people, going to you know what people would consider group meetings at this point. That that wasn't as widespread back in the in the sixties and seventies. Sure. But he reached out to people and said, "Hey, if if I can do this, you can do this." And he kept just you know setting up programs in the city of Detroit with the governor and the mayor's office, trying to get kids educated earlier on about the dangers of drugs, mm -hmm. but at the same time, like. Not using it as just a, a social platform for himself to to be boastful, sure. but to really go back and do the work and grab people up, you know, hand by hand, and just try to get them out of that suffering. So you guys decide to do this documentary, and it's taken a long time, I know, to put this together. A lot of legwork. Aaron, talk about the beginning stages. I mean, there's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of plannings, there's a lot of meetings to have meetings to, to, to kind of put this thing together. Like, yeah. like, how did you guys lay the groundwork to, to put this documentary together? Well, like Cameron mentioned before, we kind of came up with the idea and just quickly kind of went at it. And it went from a small idea into a bigger one. And so it's funny, the universe kind of the universe provides, signs, as the rock you know, likes to throughout say. The year. It's been <laughs> Even on the way here, like, you know, there was a universal sign, and, it, and it's been crazy. But, you know, um, we talked to Cameron is like a research genius, and he found all of these things and all of these people to talk to and all of these articles, and, and one road just kind of led down the other, and it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we decided to make it into a full-fledged documentary. Mm. Um, and we talked to several people. We talked to Globetrotters. We talked to um, Dr. Klein's friends, Ernie Wagner, his family, his daughter, um, just anybody we could get a hold of that had any kind of insight on his yeah. life. Yeah, so how many interviews did you guys conduct? I think ultimately it was seven interviews. Okay. Uh, seven interviews on camera. Okay. And then quite a few more where we just reached out to people by telephone to corroborate stories and kind right, of... Right, right. Hey, did that really happen type thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so many of those guys, it's, you know, Johnny at the, t um, at the time was the oldest living Harlem Globetrotter. So a lot of his teammates have, have left us at this point. So yeah. sometimes it was a matter of like, tracking down people who could cooperate it. Sometimes it was a matter of finding newspaper articles. And the funny thing about the Globetrotters is they didn't see that stuff. He didn't have like a, a huge scrapbook of his own stuff because they would get there, the newspaper would come out either the day before or the day after they left, right. talking about the game they played. So we were finding things, going back, reading it to him and saying, tell us about this. And he would say, he was like, oh, I totally forgot that. It happened, let me tell you this whole other story. And he would just kind of walk us through and told us some incredible tales of, of that time period. Yeah, I, take me back to when you finally got to sit down with, with, with John Klein and you met him for the first time. How receptive was he to, to this project and how forthcoming was he with some of the stuff he went through and some of his stories? <laughs> very much so. <laughs> I, John, John was a very dapper man. He, uh, when we went to meet him, he was sharply dressed. Um, oh, I saw just, the clip. Yeah, yeah, he had the nice gray suit looked, on and the blue tie. He yeah, looked yeah. great, and he is very proud. He, he he knows that he was a great basketball player. He'll tell you that he's a great basketball player. Um, but at the same time, he he's very humble in the sense of he knows that anything that he has done as far as you know coming through recovery, anybody can do that if they set their mind to it. And that's yeah. the one thing that he wanted to talk to us about more than anything and he and you were telling me uh, you both were telling me before uh, we went on the air that he was he was very open he was very forthcoming because I, I, he obviously understood that his story and like you said it's not so much to put himself over but to let people know hey I went through a lot you can go through a lot and you can come out the other side and I mean you were telling me some of the stories that uh, yeah. like what, what what was the most fascinating story that Dr. Klein told you what, what what sticks out when you you know I'm sure you talked to him for hours and hours and hours took copious notes and talked to all kinds of people but from him specifically what was probably the most fascinating story my favorite story that he told us was one about a heckler there in the deep south and basically the the Globetrotters dealt with a lot of racism. Sure. He played on the, at the time, the Globetrotters had three different teams that were toward different parts of America at the same time. He was on the Southern Union, and this was in the mid-1950s. Hmm. And he tells a story about with all of the, the trickery that the Globetrotters do, they would set it up whenever someone was catcalling from the stands, they would bust him in the nose with a basketball. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he walked us through the entire play and how it worked and how they did it in a way that, like, they really couldn't get in trouble for it if they did it on a basketball court, where if you punched the guy in the nose on the street, sure. it would be it would be bad. Back then, they'd get arrested. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, 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 did he speak to the fun he had being with the Globetrotters? He did. Because it seems like, you know, like I said, uh, you know, I've been watching them forever. We've all been watching the Globetrotters forever, and it just seems like 
uh, even when they were competitive to where they became more sports entertainment. It just seems like a fun experience for them. I know it's night after night and you have to be on, but you know, I would imagine he, he really enjoyed his experience with the Harlem Globetrotters. I think he did, and I think there's something about being a poor kid from Detroit and the idea that you can play the game of basketball. And at the time, even if you were a professional athlete, like the NBA was just a small thing. You're only touring a couple hundred miles where with the Globetrotters, they went all over the world. His first trip, he went to Australia, he went to New Zealand. Hmm. He went, he he met the queen whenever she was coronated. Wow. I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing where he was seeing things that changed his life, opening his, you know, his daughter talks a lot about how he, she thinks that opened his mind to things that otherwise he would have never known because to be a good athlete is something, but to actually be able to use that and go, you know, to open doors for you and see the world, that's something really special, you know, especially back then. Yeah, not a lot of people get to do that unless you're in the military like my father yeah. was uh, coming up in that in that time period. So when you met him, when you sat him down to interview him, how old was he at the time? He was 86 years old. Wow. Yeah. God bless him. Yeah. And and, and obviously his memory was as sharp as a tack, had, had all the stories down and everything like that. It, it was. He, Dr. Klein wrote 16 books, uh, multiple times kind of chronicling his, his life and travels. And so he had a pretty... He had a pretty good like repetition of this is the stories he always tells, mm -hmm. but we really sat with him and just kind of just talked to him and he told us more because I think he knew that he was getting close to the end of his life. He wanted to put it all on tape for mm -hmm. all time's sake to let everyone know I was here, you know, I existed, and this is my story. And he told us everything front to back. And then throughout the months that followed that, he would, you know, he stayed with us. I was, I, I think I spoke to him on the phone at least once a week for the wow. rest of his life. Wow. Well, that, that must have been so fascinating to get to know him and know, know what kind of man he was. Yeah. You know, you hear the stories, and then when you get, actually get to meet the, the, the person in person, that's got to be pretty fascinating. So, Aaron, I, you know, I study broadcasting. You know, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. Um, we were talking earlier. I used to do a lot of long-form projects like this, mm -hmm. um, you know, in school for whatever, you know, produce projects for school and stuff like that. It's a little bit different in the news or sports broadcasting because you're kind of gathering information and you're delivering it within sometimes a matter of minutes. When you put together something like this and, and you see it come together, for me it was always a great natural high. You know, what, what's the experience, what, what was the experience like putting this thing together? As you said, having the universe provide, having, you know, certain things you need to come through, come through, and this thing starts to take shape, and you're, and you're looking at it, and you're like, we got something here. Yeah, I mean, to say it's amazing is an understatement. <laughs> um, you know, we just have a few tickets left. This was kind of a Hail Mary project that I really wanted to, to just do and, and hope for the best. I thought that it was a really great avenue to reach different people and, you know, communicate our message. And I cannot wait until the 24th <laughs> to see all, everybody in the crowd and hear them laugh and maybe some tears and, you know, and, and I just hope that it, it educates and inspires and, you know, you know, gives that message of hope to people who may be in need. Yeah. Well, very well said. Time for our second break. We're going to come back. We're gonna, I want to talk more about addiction campuses and what you guys do on a daily basis and how you can help people because you never know. There could be somebody out there watching right now that maybe needs help or maybe th is thinking about, man, I got to, I got to, you know, change my life and maybe addiction campuses will be for you. So we'll talk more about that and we'll talk more about the great documentary that's coming out, Jumpin' Johnny. The incredible true story of Dr. John Klein, the former Harlem Globetrotter who kicked the drug addiction and became quite a humanitarian. We're back right after this on Sportsline.